Hello everybody, and my name is Mark Sage and I'm the Executive Director of the area. And welcome to our latest webinar. I'm really excited to, to welcome here today a number of long-term area members um, and a sponsor member with Medtronic and also Reflex as well. Um, and we're going to be talking about the work that I've been doing in AI about um, medical device training. Uh, next slide, please. Just real quick, an introduction to the area. I know many of you listening would, would know about the area, but uh, a quick introduction. The AR for Enterprise Alliance is, it says is a global membership funded not-for-profit alliance helping to accelerate the adoption of Enterprise AR. And we're really doing this by, as we are today, delivering that thought leadership in helping organizations understand what can be done with AR. Next slide, please, Pete. Our membership continues to grow, and there are three kind of key segments of our members. The first one are the enterprises that are successfully deploying AI, um, and Medtronic being one of those. We have a bigger group of the providers of AR technology, which includes both hardware providers like Microsoft, Lenovo, Realware, Music, Magic Leap, and then software providers as well, and obviously Reflect is an important member of that, uh, of that group. And in our third segment, we kind of bundle under non-commercial organizations, so government agencies, research institutes, universities, and standards organizations often help you know, driving the kind of future direction and developing those standards which, which are needed for the, uh, the ecosystem to mature. Next slide, please, Pete. Just a reminder, the uh, area has four strategic um, areas that we work on. The first one is about delivering thought leadership, the kind of information that business decision makers need to help them understand and invest in AR. And, and today is a great example of our thought leadership program. Uh, networking, we bring the area members together in a variety of different ways, including our committees and different events that we host as well. Educate side, that's about closing the AR skills gap. What we really focus on there is connecting the next set of skilled workers with the area members and the AR ecosystems through working with universities to help define courses, guest lecturing, outplacements, and such alike. And then finally, and a lot of work goes into this um, strategic pillar, is about reducing the barriers to AR adoption. We have a number of committees that are focusing on some of the key business challenges like safety, security, defining a set of requirements, uh, human factors and the like. Um, and these committees meet on a monthly basis to help really uh, overcome some of those barriers. Next slide, please, Pete. Just to kind of mention, we've been running what we've called a work in our work in AR series. Um, there's been a whole bunch of different uh, sessions and um, webinars like this, uh, a couple on helping create a business case, so developing AI use cases and lessons learned from, um, from companies, area members. We've also done um, some sessions on barriers to adoption, so overcoming AR safety considerations and supporting change management. Uh, last week we did a focused uh, masterclass on AR and life sciences, and today is a, is a real focus on masterclass on the medical space. So we will continue to run these, really is replacing uh, the face-to-face -face meetings, which are very difficult to do at the moment, but hopefully as we go into 2022, we'll be able to um, re-establish our face-to-face -face workshops around the world as well. Okay, next slide. And just to remind you, there's a whole raft of really interesting thought leadership and webinars that we've done over the years, all available at the, on the area website um, and also through the area YouTube channel. So you can sign up to that um, or go and enjoy those videos as well. And believe you me, there's lots of real insights there. Um, next slide. Fantastic. So um, again, welcome everybody. There's a great opportunity to ask questions. What I um, ask you to do is there should be a questions panel in your uh, GoToWebinar system. Please feel free to type in any of those questions. Um, if we get a chance at the end, we'll be, and ask the um, panel. It's, the recording will be made available 
after the event um, on the area website as well and I'm sure uh, the team at Reflect will have a version of it as well and yeah I think what I'd like to do now um, is hand over to Dirk, the President CMO of Reflect, who will be taking us through uh, the session today. And again, please remember to ask any questions that you have. Dirk, over to you, good sir. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Mark, and welcome everyone to our working AR session today. Yeah, as Mark said, my name is Dirk Schardt. I'm a CMO at Reflect. We trade work augmentation solutions for training service. And I've, I've been working in AR since uh, since 10 years, so I've seen uh, seen a lot. Wrote a book about AR, so I I'm really have a passion for that topic. And uh, today we will talk about how we how we build an, an AR guided onboarding together with the with the Medtronic team, and uh, that makes uh, the operators' work and life uh, much easier. And uh, we have prepared a couple of slides. We also have uh, uh, one or two videos uh, in the presentation. I would say we we don't want to do a typical presentation um and 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 do a little bit in a different style so we'll do it in a conversational style um so that is a little bit more interactive for for the audience and i hope you will enjoy that and uh with that i'd like to kick that off and uh, quickly hand over to peter and uh, william for a quick introduction and then i would say we can uh, jump right into the first slide peter william okay uh thanks dirk yeah uh my name is pete Ricci. Uh, and, uh, leading a technology group at, at Medtronic uh, in the uh, in the implantable um, division, and um, I've been really happy uh, to share some work with with everybody here. Um, it's been a really nice uh, it's really nice for me to to be able to share some of this stuff when we have a partner um, like Reflect and and work with Dirk and the colleagues there um, for the last uh, couple of years. Um, on uh, some of our initiatives that we want to do to try to integrate modern, you know, I'd say newer technology into our uh, traditional manufacturing space and how we can assist our uh, and help our operators, um, you know, continue to produce very high quality liability products. And working with Dirk and actually a colleague of mine, William, who I've known for, for many, many years, um, we work together periodically and I've been really happy to work with William on this. Uh, for the last couple of years uh, in the area of, of augmented and, and extended reality. I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. Uh, you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Checking my audio. Uh, so I'm William Harding. I've been with Medtronic for a little over 23 and a half years. And uh, honestly, when I think about how long I've known Pete, I don't know. <laughs> it's been uh, forever, it seems like. It's good. Um, but I, I like what Peter is emphasizing also in uh, um, the solutions and AR tech solutions specific to onboarding and training of employees. Because it's one of those things that you'll hear us talk about that magic doesn't happen here. It's not you. You don't just buy something off the shelf, put it in place and start working. That it really does take a strong partnership, uh, collaborators, people that are fully engaged um, and, and understand it's full stakeholders. And I think this is a good uh, statement of relationship that Reflect and Medtronic has um, in how we've deployed these type of solutions um, and how we've built to sustain them. So um, it's been a pleasure working with Derek and Peter on this. And, you know, one of our other colleagues, Daryl Wonkins, uh, who is one of our primary sponsors. So, Derek. Absolutely. Um, if you can uh, pull up the next slide, then I would say we, we, we start with that. And what I would like to do is, uh, Pete, if you can maybe uh, start with a, with, a, with a wrap up of that, of that journey, how you start with Daryl. Daryl is, is a side lead in, in Santa Clara. So this is where we uh, began the whole journey and where we started with the project. And I think it's it's good for the audience to understand better why did we do that? What was the problem there? Uh, and I think Peter, if you give an, if an introduction with that slide, and then we jump to the next, and we can William and myself chime in, um, and then go into the detail about uh, uh, showing and explaining the problem. I think it's a very, very important basis uh, that that everyone can understand um, how sure. we fix that. Cool. Yeah, maybe just kind of the way to summarize this, and maybe people have read through it, is is that it, uh, I had not initially met uh, folks in Reflect in Munich the year before. Uh, this started in, in um, 
this 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 work started in in our facility in, in North Bay or in South Bay, and um, uh, I had met with Lech, I, I met Dirk and uh, Daryl, who's another colleague and friend of mine at Medtronic, um, was the site leader of this facility in in, Santa, in Sunnyvale. And, um, you know, I just happened to be in town and I was at the AWE conference. And, you know, a lot of these things sometimes just happen by the way they're supposed to happen, not necessarily through some formal organized program. And uh, Daryl had seen AR before when I um, had showed it to him at his other facility um, that he was uh, working at. And um, I said, you know, we got, you know, we have this AR, we should try to see if there's some way, instead of a technology looking for a solution or, or a problem, do you have a problem? Um, is this appropriate technology seems like it could fit and and essentially what it was is hey he's like hey i've got a brand new factory brand new technology i need to onboard a lot of people i need to do it very quickly and um, i've only got a couple expert trainers and that based on our knowledge of kind of the ar industry was was basically this is kind of one of these perfect use cases of how do I get a lot of on people onboarded? How do I make sure that they're not generating scrap and following standard processes? Um, and I need to do it kind of quickly. So that was kind of like our perfect use case for AR. And it just kind of fell into us based on that, that initial meeting and meeting. Um, let me just kind of maybe talk about kind of the challenges of our, of our company. Um, usually with our products, and, and some of them are, are very intricate, it, they can really have a lengthy onboarding time. Um, and when you look at kind of some of the, our products that we make, um, you know, a lot of times when they're, they're in their infancy, the, the instructions are written typically will by engineers. They can tend to be complicated. Um, and, um, you know, you also have maybe few people at the beginning that really know how to assemble these products. There's a few technicians that understand the whole process. So it really kind of like I summarize here, it's really the perfect storm. Um, and then the other thing that happens, too, is that if you're trying to um, interact globally, especially with all the travel restrictions we've had with all of the virus restrictions of traveling internationally between facilities, and trying to transfer knowledge um, and, and have access restrictions, um, you know, all of that adds up to some major issue that of how do I impart the knowledge? How do I get these folks trained? Um, how do I bring them up and, and making sure that they're making really high quality, high reliable products um, uh, and, and they can do it in a, in a short period of time. Um, just kind of a challenge we have in a sense, you know, we're probably no different than a lot of other multinational um, companies is, uh, you know, the, the, the COVID impact, which is, you know, the travel restriction and the access restriction, that's the physical contact. But, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, people have kind of been dabbling around, I would call the industry 4.0 and the digital solutions and, and looked at them more as kind of, you know, okay, these are nice to do, but, you know, there's really no necessarily need. And, and when you look at kind of what the COVID impact was, is it really pushed these things to the forefront of how, wait a minute, you know, we've got stuff here and we need it now because of these other two things. It's, it's always easy for companies to say, well, we'll just get people on a plane and fly them, you know, to another facility and then they can learn and, and interact and onboard. Now, when you don't have that ability, you have to do things remote. And digitally, um, it really forced the uh, these solutions to kind of come to the forefront. Um, and let me go to the next slide. It's just kind of how we got here, um, and then maybe I'll I'll ask William to comment here. Is that um, I met originally met Wolfgang in in um, AWE Europe, like I said. Dirk and I connected with Daryl in May. Um, we actually had the solution and we interviewed several folks to talk to them about the solution and, and what we liked about the, the Reflect platform was that uh, it was a nice platform that we could integrate. A lot of use cases when we deal with it, um, a lot of um, sometimes uh, they're, they're, it's more hardware focused rather than necessarily platform focused. This particular uh, use case, uh, the operators were doing a lot of their assembly uh, in under microscopes. And so the concept of actually having a uh, head mounted or display software or on a, a head mounted display really wasn't conducive for the type of work they needed to do. They were in a, looking at a microscope. They didn't want to 
put their head up and then have to put something down on over their head. So having a platform that we could put on a, on a, on a mobile device, like an iPad or a phone, was, was really advantageous for this. And then the other part of this was, how do we get some key resources from Medtronic that, that can help me? My background is in material science, metallurgy. It's not in, in AR and augmented reality, but I've been re learning the, the technology in the last five years. But William, my colleague, and I said, you know, like, William be great. And William will always gets excited about these types of things. So they brought him in. We worked a climb pilot and then we worked on some deployment on this. So William, maybe I'll have you comment here and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, sure, Peter. And that's actually a great intro. What I liked about what Peter did here, you know, is it, often when we're trying to uh, look at solutions, um, we, we really need to think about, you know, assessing, exploring and stuff with this. And I, I thought it was cool because I told Peter to, you know, don't, don't give me any perceptions. Tell me what your, your needs are. You know, and I had a tendency to be a little bit overly you know, uh, grandiose in what I was thinking. And so Dirk and, I mean, uh, Daryl and Peter were able to kind of ground and say, okay, this is what we really need. And like Peter said around, there's a lot of cool stuff around headsets and other AR, VR type things. I'm hearing a lot of background noise. If everybody wants to mute that's not talking, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so in either case, um, these type of things didn't work you know, the way we wanted. So one of the things I told Peter is, don't tell me exactly what you are looking at. Let me do some deep dives. And it was really nice because we were able to explore uh, different solution providers. Um, we weren't trying to fit a solution um, to like kind of wedge it into a, a problem, basically, where we were trying to address. We really wanted to find a, like I said, a partner that could do what we call a transformative engine, something that could interconnect, that wasn't you know, dependent on a particular technology. It was more platform agnostic. And so I was very pleased to come back from this really deep dive assessment of Reflect and a few other uh, suppliers and say, okay, these are the people that will reduce risk to Medtronic, that will meet Daryl and Peter's needs and will be able to grow with us. And who seem to be, and just from our initial assessment, great partners that are going to be able to bring their, not just offer a solution, but to bring their skills and their teams, like their architects, their project management, uh, these people that are willing to vest extra time and to make sure we succeed. So it was really a, a really surprising aha, and it was uh, um, it was very satisfying to what Peter said around Daryl's needs on um, you know when Daryl said, "Hey, I've got only limited resources. How do I make best use of them? How do I bring on this constant flow of new employees? You know, to make sure that they're able to produce this you know critical medical devices." Uh, so we're very pleased with the way this has worked out and why it, how it's continued. Yeah, and 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 William, maybe maybe to add that uh, now now when we when we look back and when when we started that was 2019. There was not even COVID, um, and 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 Daryl uh, talked about these 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 problems uh, fi finding the right operators, um, getting them on board, getting them trained, and then you know, setting up such a, a manufacturing side. Uh, and then in the meantime, uh, COVID hit us and, and kind of made everything worse. Uh, so I think that, that, that the situation um, which, we, which we found there was a really challenging one. And we will come to that, I guess, in a second also. I, re I still remember uh, the, first, the first meeting we had together with a training lead there on, on site, and when he mm -hmm. explained us, uh, and, and, and you, you, you know that, when he explained us um, th that he's kind of um, the, the one who, and call, 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 let, let's, let's call him, he's, a, he's kind of the, he, or he was at least, the, the brain had all of that knowledge, and he still has that knowledge, uh, but how difficult it is to transfer that knowledge to, to, the, to these new operators and uh, without uh, getting interrupted all the time while doing the training. So, um, I mean, on one side, you know, I've, I've realized what what uh, what problems that they have. But on the other hand, and that's what I what I found interesting. And there, would also like to have uh, uh, Pete and William then you commenting on it. Um, you know, the first the first time we had that conversation, Daryl was of course was convinced. We knew, uh, yes, we can solve that. But then I think a key, a key part of it was that we really involved the the, the users from the first day on. Um, Good point. We, we didn't just give him the give them the solution and say, hey, here it is. It's super cool. Just use it. No, we asked them. We asked them also about, you know, what are your concerns about that? 
And I remember that day, so I had concerns at the first, first step about what, what is that with the new technology. And I think that was a very important point and it helped me quite well. Well, you know, uh, what you're saying, Dirk, is uh, very important. A lot of people, um, like we even did our research, you know, to Peter's things, you know, and he comes from the academic world, uh, his PhD in, in material science and so on, is looking at the depth of the really support um, that this is a gap, this is a need. And so really doing that aspect. But what you were saying around meeting with the operators, meeting with the people, I think it's an underestimated uh, effort that needs to be more, uh, placed at a higher level that you don't, don't, don't engage these operators only at the final deployment and UAT and sustainability part. You really pull them in from the beginning of that story. And that's what was really nice about the way all, all of us work, you know, as far as you guys in the leadership, you know, um, us in the, on, on the reflect and Medtronic side of really executing on this and, and listening to the voice of that uh, customer before we actually try to implement something. It's a very good point, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Uh, I'll, I'll move on here and see yeah. just kind of how we want to leverage this too, right? So it's not just okay. Get like I think William and Dirk said, just give somebody a solution, and say okay, go use it, and then you know, then it essentially gets stuck on the wall and it, and it fails. Is is really you know kind of how we want to leverage this, and our vision is really kind of how we transfer knowledge. Um, from trainers to new operators, but then it's not just training someone. It, it might be also R and D transferring knowledge to engineers or, or Medtronic to customers, right? So there's and not necessarily this particular use case, but but um, there's a lot of knowledge transfer. Manufacturing, obviously, is what we're dealing with here. Um, also, when you do with product transfer, if you need to transfer things, if you have ramp plans and you transfer things between facilities, and if they're not co-located. Um, you want to basically, uh, you know, help people along and, and be able to augment or, or digitize some of the content is very helpful. And then, you know, cu customer service, maintenance, repair, um, especially if people are, are remote or not necessarily on site, is, is really kind of how we leverage leverage this going forward. Um, kind of the overall project overview. I spoke to some of these 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 uh, elements at the beginning, which is. We have lengthy onboarding process, complicated instructions. So, you know, we also need to do this fast. This isn't something you can sit there and play around with for five years and, 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 and mess around with either. We have to kind of scope, build, test, learn, and improve, and, and do it with a certain time. Um, the nice part about it, what we loved about the, the platform we had, which is it's, it's platform agnostic, and, and that's what we like about solutions. We don't like um, you know, with the, the hardware and the AR industry, you know, continually evolving and, and, and um, progressing, um, you know, if you have a platform where you can bring different devices into that platform, whether it's tablets or a headwear or HoloLens or, you know, name your favorite headset or, or whatever that is, whether it's an Apple device or a, a Samsung or an Android device. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, too, is, is what William, I think, hinted on, too, a little bit with not only um, the operators, but, you know, the people that are managing the platform need to be able to, you know, easily update content and digitize it and then coordinate the, the rollout of that across the facility. I mean, the thing that we saw was is, is in the operator's feedback we got because we had the engagement, which is the increased proficiency time. Um, the less human involvement. I mean, we also have remote assistance, but the less human involvement isn't that you don't want to displace your trainers. It's if you can imagine a situation where I have new 10 new trainees and I have one trainer, uh, if somebody's having a problem, they, they might have to traditionally wait for the trainer to finish with someone else before they bring them over to, to help them with something. And this way, it's like they might get a bit background information, but then if they have the content at their um, disposal, they can actually, you know, not necessarily burden the trainer. And, and then the other thing is too, is usually these trainers are usually an expert technician um, that you want to utilize and, and have pr productive doing something else rather than just strictly training people. Um, so that's the nice part too. Um, hey, Peter, if you don't mind, just as a quick interjection, yeah. to a good point you brought up is for everyone listening is what you might not realize is the previous way of training was to bring a person into our clean room, class 1000, and put a stack of papers literally in front of them with some images, and, and hopefully they would come away trained 
enough to manufacture these devices. So to really kind of level set and what Peter just said, the baseline, so we understand what we're changing and fixing um, and uh, specific around the needs of the operators was super important. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Let me go forward and, and maybe Dirk, if you want to do an introduction here of, uh, of just an um, example. Yeah, I have, I have one quick point maybe before we start with the with, okay. the, with the video um if you, if you can quickly go back to the to the other slide if you have enough time sure. uh yeah that's perfect um and, and i would like to to uh, to, to have uh williams uh, uh come in uh, again here you know what i see what i see very often with the use cases and we we, we made the same mistakes uh, years ago you often see the left part and then you see the right part of that slide but you don't see the middle part of it Right, and I think this is the key here. And uh, and and William, you and, and and from our side, Victor, you you guys work on you, you led that. I guess it's interesting for the participants here in the in the webinar also. What what exactly is the key part here when we talk about you know the the onboarding and the UAT, the user acceptance testing, in order to have these the, the operators involved to make it successful. I guess it it's important that you maybe uh, talk a little bit about that. And that's actually a really good point, Dirk. Is and I'll use an example. We all go to conferences and we hear vendors saying, I, I can be your solution provider, we'll pop it in. But what Dirk's speaking to and what you know, people like his teammates and Peter, myself, and Daryl kind of looked at is we have unique needs. We have FDA requirements. We have secure environments. We have a need to protect data and patients. And it's not something as simple that you can just drop in and suddenly magical connections occur to your LMS, your MES systems and, and whatnot. So really understanding, listening to what is not just the people's needs, but the infrastructure, the stakeholders that could be IT quality regulatory and bringing those people in, but not to the level that it overwhelms. You got to still, you can't run this as a single line of a critical, a critical line of failure. You have to really run this in parallel branches. And so one of the nice things about this adaptive team we have is we were going through our global security office, going through our our, um, our IT structures or other aspects while looking at the operators, while talking with, uh, um, working with architects on both Reflect and Medtronic side to really lay this out clean because it's not just a drop in place like a Microsoft Word scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for uh, giving uh, some more some more details there, William. That's, uh, that's great. Um, okay. Yeah, P Peter. Let's let's uh, let's maybe chat to the to the videos. Um, we have two videos. I, I'll just uh, start, and then uh, Pete, William, feel free to chime in. Okay. Um, and uh, for, for for the audience, uh, you, you can start. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, you 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 will see now parts of the of the of the solution, and and you will also see in a in a second. Uh, you know, this is not the typical trade show super showcase what you see with a lot of beautiful graphics. No, this is just a helpful <laughs> app. Right, and <laughs> we, I mean, you know, as people sometimes expect these beautiful applications, but we have an yeah, application. Where's the exciting that really helps. VR part? They wonder exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and what you can see here, you see uh, uh, part lists, you, you see warnings, you see security requirements, safety requirements, as you can see here, with a simple video to watch quickly, which is the mandatory before you. Uh, actually open the, the the rest of the application you have the instructions there even in, in PDF so that one of the one of the key the key advantages I, I, I see for the operators is you have different forms of content so they, they can whatever they want to have because operators are different right some people they want to have images some people they want to have videos some people they only want to have AR so we combine everything on a contextual basis and now you see that uh, first here in a, in a so-called 3D view, uh, the, the different steps, uh, what they what they have to perform. On the left side, you always have to, um, on the screen, instructions step by step, and then on the right side, or here in a full screen, you have then the, the, the live view and the actual 3D parts. William, Peter. If you don't mind, Dirk, um, just yeah. as a quick interjection is, for everyone watching, these are RF ablation uh, devices. Um, so when you think of people with varicose veins and other things, this is where these components might be used. And to support what Dirk is talking about is the different formats, even that first page of the Medtronic mission statement. You know, what people, if a VP showed up or a CEO showed up and said, what's your mission? What's your, uh, what, what are your tenants? 
having those available on a device. And then like he said, is be able to project this in both augmented reality or virtual reality, depending like you know, some of those were shown in virtual reality and having supported document and images. So depending on how you like to look at data, you can look at it in any format that best re relates to the way you're, you might perceive the actions you need to complete. Yeah, thanks for adding that, uh, William. And uh, um, Pete, if you don't mind, yeah, go, go ahead, Pete. Sure. Yeah, no, I was going to say also just, I think, you know, you guys commented just fine. I think the, the issue or the, the, the point I thought you made that was really sounding to the point, which is um, it, it wasn't a matter of you know, doing, say, virtual reality or still images. It was the ability to com combine things into either do we want to take CAD data and, and, and digitize it and animate it or do we want to take video and integrate it or still images and integrate it. It's just the ability to, to do Kind of the flexibility of doing any, whatever makes sense for that process. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Um, and then this is just uh, another one, Dirk, if you want to comment on this one. But this is another thing that talks about just strictly a uh, specific assembly step. And you, as you can see is that it, it, it's a very, you know, people can actually uh, integrate with or activate it with QR code. Um, it walks them through the step um, and, and you can get as sophisticated or as, as simple as you want with this to try to, to help the operators uh, know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. You know, Peter, you touched on a really important part there is, you know, when you're looking at this anchored to a desk and the people can see a digital twin of what they might see in reality, this really emphasizes the need around, you can have the best AR, VR tools, but you have nothing if you don't have the content. And that's an area that I always caution people when you're developing solutions, you really have to get resources, you really have to get people working together. You know, we had secondary team members collecting digital images, uh, building uh, components like you're seeing these 3D uh, digital twins. But that is really what is going to give the power to behind this power behind your solution. So don't underestimate the amount of time it takes to build this type of digital content. Yeah, Dirk, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to this particular video. No, nothing to add, uh, uh, William, and, and, and you, you uh, covered that very well. So I guess uh, we can go to the next one. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So again, you know, just how we've integrated this, I mean, it's a combination. The nice part, like I'm going to emphasize, is it's a combination of taking still images from the work instruction, say a part list, uh, taking, um, you know, complete virtual images um, that are artificial, but then also integrating that artificial with the real parts themselves. And you can see maybe on the bottom left of what you're working with there. I mean, it's, there's a lot of other industries. If you look at, like, say, aircraft and maintenance, and we're in the macro world, I mean, the folks, you can see the fingers there, the types of things that we're manufacturing um, for integration within the, you know, the human body for, for therapy are, are pretty small. So, um, being able to get an appreciation for that kind of blown up um, while we, before they're working on it was really, really important. Um, you know, just kind of highlight what I think the, the benefits are it is really what we were able to measure is, is compared to the existing training methods that, that this is about 50% faster. And it's not just um, expeditious, somebody doing a process expeditiously, if you look at just the, the speed it's the ability to get somebody on board and get them proficient about 50% faster. The, the other part, which is it's a little bit more difficult to quantify, and it really isn't too bad, but it takes a little bit more time, is, is really the amount of scrap that's that's generated. When you when you train somebody and you're trying to, to have them assemble a real product, you do generate some scrap in the sense that they that you want them to, to, to go practice on the real the real thing versus a test vehicle. So there is not just the speed, it, it's actually scrap generation. Um, you don't necessarily want to train somebody and they come in the first day to, to assemble uh, one of our uh, devices and then put that in a, a, a good pile to ship. I mean, usually they practice on materials while we're getting proficient. Um, and, you know, the proficiency time for the, you know, the existing operators too. And, and, and you know, these processes may change. And so being able to update those and educate people on that um, is very helpful. And then, you know, getting rid of the trainer involvement 
it isn't that you get rid of your trainers, it's that you're able to maybe not be as much of a burden on them uh, as you normally would. Um, you know, and then from the platform perspective, that, that's really what I look for from an engineering perspective and, and my leadership perspective is to say, can I bring a platform? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, and I've talked, William and I have talked about this many times, if you hate one-off solutions where, okay, at this facility, at this use case, it needs this technology solution. Okay, at this other use case, same facility, we've got another technology solution. It's too much to manage. Um, and then, you know, you can, how easy and flexible is it? And then, um, you know, we can digitize our, our training environment. And then how you can combine it, 2D, 3D images, video, still images, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, William or Dirk, any additional comments on this? No, I think you Thank covered you. it really well, Peter. And, you know, don't, under, don't underestimate what Peter is saying here in building your your constructs and so on um but there's a lot of good tools we use utilize a lot of different things both on the reflect and medtronic side to capture these content to build these content to smooth it out you know there's a lot to the digital content management aspects of it so there's a lot of background structure you need to think about as you're building these type of solutions okay um you know and then I, I guess we can, and I think Dirk highlighted this at the beginning, so did William too, is, is this is, I mean, this we didn't, we didn't make this stuff up. This is uh, real operator feedback. Um, they, you know, they, they really loved it. I mean, we did ask them, we said, can you guys, I mean, come on, be serious with this. What, what are some negative things can you kind of to say? Some, and there's always like little ticky tack things for improvement. The, the, the biggest thing they wanted is how do we do more of this? Um, and uh you know how do we do it more how do we do you know more processes how do we get more work instructions um uh and uh that was you know some of the feedback we got from the operators i don't know william and dirk maybe if you want to comment any more on the, um well i'll um, let dirk go first but I, I wanted to add something once you're you're done dirk go ahead okay yeah thanks william and then thanks pete really really quickly i mean you you, you covered it uh, pete i think it's this is the result of uh, really involving the the operators and uh and 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 you know it's so important to hear also what they need and how they work with it and really see that uh and it makes a huge difference and of course at the end of the day it's uh it's, it's, it's the best thing you can get when you get these uh, these, these, these kind of feedback um so I said that's why I why I wanted to highlight or why I asked William to highlight that middle part of that of one of the previous slides so much. Uh, it's not only about the left side on the starting point and the result. It's really you know it's it's a journey, and on that journey you need to involve the the the, the users and uh, and that's why we why we have these results, William. No, and I like what you just said there, Dirk, is that, you know, when we were doing this, you know, we made sure that our operators, our production, our supervisors, our trainers knew that they were our real bosses. You know, we're not marching in there telling them what they're going to, you know, what they're actually going to put in place. You know, we have listened to the stories. There's constant checking. And one of the things that uh, Dirk, Peter, myself, and Daryl all really want to do is create a standard process. And that means even the UAT, the hyper care, well, hyper care after UAT, sustainability, and even consideration of end of life or the life cycle of solutions. So it really was a thorough process. And in doing the UAT portion, you know, I really loved how the whole team worked together and that the operators and them, the enthusiasm, the energy we saw from them, that if anything, this is just a mild sampling of the enthusiastic responses we got from them. So it was really encouraging when you're sitting or biting your nails thinking, are they going to like beat me around and say, and here's people saying, oh, I don't really like Apple iPads or I don't like this. And then so at the end, they're saying, hey, can I get one of these? Can I have a copy of that? Or you know, and just seeing the enthusiasm and hunger for this was really reassuring. Yeah, okay. that's a good point. And, and then maybe one, 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 one last thing, and uh, we, we also we also discussed about that. Um, in, in in many cases, uh, we 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 hear you know um, we're in the enterprise world, and you don't need a specific UI, and you don't need to have great UX uh, because it's all all and only. And enterprise uh, applications are complex and things like that. But uh, you know, we, we always said, well, these these operators they also have Netflix at home, and they also have an iPad at home, and they also probably uh, 
uh, a shop are doing they're doing a shopping at at uh, uh, Amazon, and I think that makes a difference, right? Providing a good user experience and and giving them a good user interface uh, that they really like to use it, and not just someone is telling them, "Hey, that's a tool. Now use it." Um, that that was uh, yeah, good statement, uh, William. Exactly. Good, oh, Peter. Um, um, you know, I just. Just when we said, I mean, part of part of I think what we're doing is is looking, you know, kind of saying, okay, well, you know, you set the foundation, you look at the platform, and then you kind of say, well, okay, will this really work for, uh, you know, operator training and onboarding? What what else could we potentially, you know, use the technology for? Right? It's not a, you know, not just a, a unitask or looking at just okay onboarding and training. So. You know, we said, okay, well, it's it's not just that, and we could use it for facility transfers if we want to, you know, transfer production or move things around. Um, you know, we want to use it for factory line design. Um, so interacting with operators on how do we lay out a line and using it for remote collaboration assistance. So, you know, we kind of, you know, this is maybe part of our little marketing slide in, in a way, but it really is just kind of, you can use it for more than one thing, and, and you also have to be careful to make sure that it's not the the, the uh, you know don't sell it too much, right? Because with new technology like this, if it if it doesn't work, people tend to get a bad name for it too. So to be careful about you know how it's used and, and where it's used is is very beneficial. So um, I think I'm not sure if this is the last one, Dirk, or if there's yeah. that's the last one, Pete. Okay, so um. I guess we're we're kind of at the 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 end here. I, I'm not sure if uh, maybe Mark or, or Dirk or if if we yeah. have some questions to answer or yeah. yeah. Sorry, this Mark. is Mark. Yeah. Good. Uh, firstly, okay, fantastic guys. Thank you. Thank you all of um, all of you uh, for your great insights. It was you know from someone who's been working on some of the barriers to adoption helping companies overcome them here at all the you know the great things we talked you talked about the content you talked about getting the users involved and security and safety and, and all of those bits so a really great insight into that um i think we've got we've got a few questions and again i um ask anyone of the attendees feel free to um type in a question into the questions box but the first one i'd like to ask is uh uh, question is interesting in hearing more about what requirements needed to fulfill meet from a FDA perspective and how MES plus LMS systems come into play from a workflow perspective. Any kind of listening it, insights on that, guys? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'll take a first stab at it. So when we think of these type of solutions, we we don't say they're the only. They We need to work in conjunction or transform data and, and interconnect as interfaces to other types of solutions. So though, like as Peter described, this is a very manual intensive system with a lot of microscopes, there wasn't a lot of technology integration. However, Medtronic has requirements around our manufacturing execution systems in how they manage traceability how that works with our quality systems, how that works with our learning systems around operator certification, um, and as ultimately even our supply chain, our business intelligence. Um, and, you know, I won't go into different brands and things, but, you know, ultimately all our reporting and so on systems that we have to manage because this might be just one puzzle of a solution. It then might be something where parts are completed and moved to another facility. So how do we move that data? So in the areas of transformation, inter interconnection, and whether it's through APIs or SDKs, these are things that we considered relative to our integration. Now, the first deployment was what we called a learning assist. So that was an assisted uh, training for the employee onboarding and, and methods for basic refresher training. But as we move it along to next phases, that's where we integrate it with our other systems uh, to truly create that interoperable solution. Yeah, I think... I think that's an important point, William. Is is that the um, uh, to make here with this is is if you start with I need to fully integrate this if my learning management system, regulatory submissions, FDA, all that at the beginning. Um, we knew at the beginning if we started to try to go all the way to that endpoint, it, it would never get off the ground. So what we did is we said let's demonstrate the technology. First. Let's look at the use case. Let's get the operators 
We're not using it to displace or replace their formal work instructions. It's being used as a uh, training aid and a supplement in the business process. Not, you know, you can look to the future and say, yeah, could the future be that all their work instructions would be done digitally like this? Then you have to worry about, well, how many devices you have, updating the content, um, submissions when you change work instructions. We said, okay, let's do the first step first and do that really well which is a training aid. And then later on, as we're progressing here now, we're trying to figure out, okay, how does this work within our own quality systems and regulatory systems? Um, and once we start crossing into that, then we have to work on all that compliance and maintenance of that. So, so thank you guys. To, to kind of add to that a little bit, because there's another question which is related. Um, and I guess this is just showing where you are in terms of your journey here. But the question is, if design change is needed on components, are the AR experiences updated as well? So it's all kind of around the audience. One hundred percent. And that yeah. that is such that's a, such an important thing because change management is critical. You know, having an adaptive system that if you modify a small image, a document, whatever, how do you revision control that, how you roll it out? How do you maintain the right stakeholders? Everybody's involved so that they systematically are notified and um, and assured that what's being put out complies with um, our build requirements. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, no, I, I'd say, yeah, that, the, the short answer to that, Mark, is yes. I mean, that if, if anything's changed, say, for instance, on a process or a design or something like that, well, the management of it goes back to kind of how that gets integrated into all the devices you have and updated and rolled out and, and, and how do you notify the operators that, okay, step seven of 14 changed. So, all that has to be managed and integrated into this. Fantastic, thank you guys. Um, uh, one other question, uh, is the reflect procedures replacing the existing SOP for the procedure or is it considered supplementary material? I think I know the answer, but it'd be good to get your guys. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we answered that, it's, it's a supplemental. It's supplementary, I mean, yeah. Ideally, you could look at a future state um, and say, yeah, you could use this solution and replace everything. Nature, the nature of the business we're in, in the highly regulated industry, um, it, it, trying to get to that end state all at once is is uh, going to take a long time, and, and uh, you know it's integrating well. Uh, maybe Thank to add you. to that, um, also from a from a user's perspective, we we always uh, tend to replace things when we have new technologies, right? And we're trying to replace XYZ since uh, years with AR and VR. But uh, when you look how the how the user adoption actually works, uh, this is by forming a habit or changing a habit, right? This is what we have seen uh, last year during uh, COVID, where people then started to purchase online and set off uh, going into a grocery store, and things like that. They're changing a habit. Um, and uh, that's something it takes time. It needs to be rewarded. And it's not just uh, uh, happening from one day to the other. And I think this is what often is not considered when we when we use or try to implement new technologies. We just say, oh yeah, we, we will replace that X Y with with with, with Y, but it, it doesn't work, right? Uh, that's that's my my over my recommendation. Think about what are the what are the existing habits? What are people using today? What are the existing uh, alternatives? What they use, whether it's paper or video, or whatever. And what needs to happen that that users uh, actually use something else? And when you think about that, then uh, then you will realize uh, that uh, it's a process, and that's exactly why we did that. And what 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 William and Peter described, it's a it's a training aid. It's a it's a it's assisted uh, solution, um, and it might replace in the future, but it already improves the onboarding significantly and uh, without uh, without having the need of replacing completely. And I think that's important. Yeah, and if you look at our stakeholders, I mean, you know, if you say you do a stakeholder analysis and you say well, some of our stakeholders are, say, folks in the quality and learning management system, um, you know, if you can demonstrate this first, kind of, in an, I, I, this isn't completely offline, right? It, it's a business process, it's an assistant. Um, and you get, you know, versus if you come to them and say, hey, well, we got this great solution, we're going to integrate it in and, and do all this stuff, they might be a little hesitant, especially from a quality perspective. But 
If you can do this as a training assistant to start and show them the effectiveness and then you show the operators really like it, right, then there's a pull. So I think that's a better way of doing it versus trying to try to sell somebody something, especially with new technology like this that maybe they haven't seen before in practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, if it's okay, I'd like to ask one more kind of question before we close. Um, sure. And, and it's really about the ROI, you know, it's another key theme that the, the area and our members are uh, working on, we have the ROI calculator. You talked a couple of times and, you know, this was about the 50% improvement. Can you talk a little bit about how you went measuring that? Is it a very statistical led thing or is it more kind of gut feel and just how that kind of process or how that information was um, captured? Probably a little of both. I mean, it's 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 combination of um and it's not just even the roi part of it it's the onboarding it's it's also um you you look at the so what you do is you look at the um the existing trainers uh the the people that we were dealing with in the facilities the one or two and they and, and basically you ask them you say you know how long does it really take you to onboard somebody and they might say hey what takes a couple i mean the answer from them was it takes a couple months and it's like some of these processes, just in some of the specific processes, they won't feel comfortable um, only for a couple of weeks. So some of it is through anecdotal data that you try to quantify, and then you use that as your baseline. And then, and then when you get the uh, new operators, then you kind of go back to those trainers and say, what do you think? And, and they're saying, yeah, I brought in this operator and, and they were proficient in, you know, a few weeks. We don't have all the statistical analysis, right? Where you'd say, okay, I got 10 operators, I brought them on board, and um, and and you know, you don't have that that data set yet. I mean, we we have some of that information, but but the goal was to say, okay, at this date, let's start these people on this process and this work instruction. And um, it's not just the training too. Is if you you also want to um, you know kind of set up production between like say um, the example the example would be let's say I want to set up production of two sites typically what you do is you have operators or people come from that other site and then they'll sit on site and then they may go back and, and you know if they're if, let's just assume that they're far away um, you're kind of stuck because they, they leave and then they might forget and um, so there's also saving on travel time and and scrap and rework and that type of thing too. So I don't know, Dirk or William, if you want to comment any more on that. Yeah, if you don't mind, Peter is, and Peter brings up some really good points there is that when, and to your question mark, even around gut feel versus, you know, statistical or, or data type supporting our decisions is we, when we think about how to get people to work together is a lot of people think, oh, you just throw a bunch of people together, you have somebody facilitate them and, you, and things will happen. And we know that's not the case. We really behind the scenes, we were the duck, you know, looking calm on the surface, but paddling, scrambling big time with our feet to stay steady. And it wasn't like we were having difficulties, but it was just so much, so much orchestrating that we had to do to the point of even thinking about, like Peter mentioned, the employees, the operators is, are we dealing with a young operator who uh, has never touched technology? Are we dealing with an older operator who's used a lot of technology? You know, so thinking of technology adopters, laggers, we actually, and I know as Victor representing the Reflect team, he and I went through these discussions many times around really putting almost what this is called, almost like a qualitative research effort of how do you really gather the information without overburdening the people, but then also how do you appeal to each of those different characteristics and desires? Um, so it's not just dropping something on and putting it in their lap and saying work with it. But they think even to the point of the right keyboard, the right monitor, you know, the right uh, cover for an iPad. You know, every little thing had to be thought it out, thought out, so that we could really consider whether it's language. You know, a lot of the um, a lot of the people at our facility that are talk uh, spoke Vietnamese. So you know, how do we hand overcome some of the language barriers? And then also, how do we make the data and information and technology useful from the operator to the supervisor to the trainer to the manager to the general manager and other sites? So there was a lot of things behind the scenes, and we actually did do assessments. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a quantitative, but it would really be kind of almost qualitative assessment of the information so that we can make the best decisions. Fantastic, thank you. That's great. 
Just guys, I, any more questions? We'll, we'll we'll follow up with um with a written response. Uh, I can't thank you enough, uh, William, Pete, and Dirk for a really insightful um, webinar. Uh, it's been great, uh, and thank you for the support of the, the area. We'll have this recording up so people can listen to it again. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously please feel free to reach out to myself, markettheareaorg and I wish you all a great rest of your day. And thanks again, guys, for great insights. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Take care.